1 Samuel chapter 3, the first 10 verses. 1 Samuel chapter 3, the first 10 verses. God's given me a word for his church today. And I'm calling it, the title I've given it is, You'd Better Take That Call. <laughs> You'd Better Take That Call. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 3, beginning at the first verse, reading through the tenth verse. And if you would just, you don't have to stand, because in this environment, it's a little close. We don't want to block the cameras and all. I'll put it on the screen so you can see it if you don't have a Bible in front of you. Amen. And for our friends online, we have some people who sit in front of the camera. We have some people who sit behind the camera. Not everybody's, we have some people wanting to come to church. They're so afraid they'll get caught on camera. So, so uh, we invite you to get settled in for a word from God. 1 Samuel chapter 3, the first 10 verses. And the word of the Lord today reads, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious. In those days there was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place. And his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. And Samuel was laid down to sleep. That the Lord called Samuel. And he answered, Here am I. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not, lie down again. And he went and laid down. And the Lord called yet again Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I call not my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and laid down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. Hallelujah. You'd better take that call. I'm going to talk to us for a little while today. If you bow your heads with me one more moment, Father. Once again, God, we come to you humbly in prayer acknowledging the need for your involvement in every part of our service. Master, we need you if we're to worship in a manner that is acceptable for the Word of God declares you desire that men and women, boy and girl, worship you in spirit and in truth. We need you, God, when the Word of God goes forth, for there is no benefit in our hearing, there is no change in our heart, if we hear merely the word of men, we need a word from the Lord. We need to hear from heaven today. I believe, God, you placed this message in my heart, and I've meditated upon it all week long, desiring that you would quicken within me every word that you would have me to speak to your people today. Master, I pray that the anointing would rest heavily upon me today. Help me, God, to deliver a word from heaven for the people of God that will provide nourishment, that will provide encouragement, that will provide inspiration, and most of all, 
Lord, that will cause our faith to rise up and grow. We need you today, God, more than ever before we've needed you. Our relationship with you today needs to be strengthened and buttressed. We ask all this in that precious saving name, Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. You'd better take that call. Praise God. Here's little Samuel. His mother had had him, brought him to the house of God, presented him to Eli, and said, I'm dedicating this child to God. I'm giving my child to the service of the Lord. And he was raised in the house of God under the tutelage of the priest uh, Eli. Now Eli had sons and this Samuel no doubt was raised in the company of Eli's sons. And you know we live in a world today where it is often expected that when daddy dies or daddy retires that the son will take over the business. Isn't that the way it generally works? Well, in the priesthood, there were only certain people who could serve as priests. You had to be a Levite. Well, it happened that by birth, uh, Samuel was a Levite. He did belong to the house of Levi, so he qualified to be a priest. And this is why his mother brought him and, it, you know, uh, dedicated him to the Lord in the house of God. But Eli's sons, who were also Levites, who should have been in a place to uh, take over when their father was no longer able to serve in the priesthood, had gone off in a very evil and an ungodly direction. They had begun to behave in manners that were very displeasing to the Lord and very upsetting to God. And this did not please the Lord at all. And finally, one night, little Samuel was laying in his bed and he heard a voice calling. Little Samuel. Samuel. And Samuel got up from his bed and he went into... Eli's room and said, yes, sir, you're calling me? And Eli said, no, I'm not calling you. Go back to bed. And this happened three times before Eli finally caught on and said, wait a minute. You know what? This kid isn't just mishearing. He's hearing something, but it's not me that's calling him. I have a feeling that God is trying to call him. I remember personally, I've told this story before, but I love to tell it because it, it was such a wonderful experience for me. I remember sitting on the pew of that little Pentecostal church in southern New England where I grew up. And I remember just sitting there watching the pastor on the pulpit and he was kind of preaching and people were worshiping and, and there was a lot of noise going on. And all of a sudden, all at once, in a moment's time, the room literally felt dead silent. And Bill, I, I started looking around and I'm seeing people's mouths moving, and I'm seeing people raising their hands, and I'm seeing people clap their hands. And I look at the pastor, and he's still up there preaching, but I'm not hearing anything. It was literally dead silent. And all of a sudden, I heard a voice, and it was not a booming voice. You know how in the movies they always present God. This is God speaking, you know. It wasn't like that. I heard the calmest voice I've ever heard. If the room hadn't gone quiet, I'd have never heard this voice. And I heard a voice say, that's what I want you to do. Just like that. That's what I want you to do. Just as calm and quiet as that. And I said, what? What do you want me to do? Because <laughs> I didn't understand what was being said. And then the voice said, I want you to preach. And as soon as I'd heard those words, the sound came back up and I was right back in the service and all the noise was there and I was hearing everything. But boy, I'm going to tell you, when God speaks, He has a way of getting your attention. And you know what? God oftentimes doesn't speak above the noise. He speaks to us in the quiet times. 
Amen. You know, sometimes when you're laying on your bed and you've got things on your mind and you're just like, all of a sudden you hear the voice of the Lord say, Amen. you know, you acted like a fool today. <laughs> you might want to apologize to this person or you might, you know, or you might get a direction or you might get comfort for some trial or struggle that you're going through. But, you know, in the dark hours, in the quiet hours, that's oftentimes when God is best able to speak and when we are best able to hear. Am I telling the truth? Amen. Amen. Well, the sons of Eli had fallen far from the place which their father occupied. They engaged in all kinds of evil and ungodly behaviors. And there was in, and they were in no wise prepared to pick up their father's mantle and lead the nation of Israel with a prophetic voice. But God did not leave that position vacant. He had strategically placed Samuel under the tutelage, yeah, Samuel under the tutelage of Eli so that he could become that prophetic voice so greatly needed by Israel. When the Lord finally got Samuel to understand, it was him talking, and Samuel said, Speak, your servant's listening, I'm listening. Then the Lord said, Now Samuel, I've got a work for you to do. I've got something I need for you to do, and here's how it's going to start. It's going to start by me filling you in on something that you need to tell Eli. You know what he had to tell Eli? He didn't have to tell Eli, Eli, you've been perfect, son. You've done a marvelous job. We're so proud. I'm so proud of you. No, that isn't the word God had for Eli. No, the word God had for Eli was the word of judgment. Now imagine little Samuel, just a child, receiving a word from God that he's to deliver to his mentor, right? And it's a word of judgment. Your sons have gotten out of hand, and you have done nothing to rein them in. And I'm here to tell you, God said that judgment is going to come upon you and your sons because the Lord is very unpleased. He's very displeased with the conduct of these young men. You know, it's interesting that Eli, excuse me, that Samuel grew up with Eli, he grew up around Eli's sons, yet he didn't act like Eli's sons. Isn't it interesting that here little Samuel was, the word of God said he ministered unto the Lord. Samuel was focused on the work of the ministry. Eli's sons, who should have been focused on the work of the ministry, were focused on women and wine and song. They were focused on all kinds of other things, but they weren't focused on that which as Levites they ought to have been focused on. I'm going to tell you a little secret today, folks. Too many people want to believe that the church just always does the right thing. And when I say the church, I don't mean this church. I don't mean a denomination. I don't mean any particular organization. I mean simply the church, the church universal. Whatever denomination, whatever organization you belong to, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, especially those who have believed and obeyed the apostolic message of the gospel, they want to believe that through the years they've always done the right thing. But you know what's sad? A lot of times as daddy died, sons have led the church in the wrong direction. The next generation has not always led the church down the same path that the father had begun. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? No, oftentimes things have uh, digressed and things have grown worse because the leadership has not been focused on ministering to the Lord. I know there's a lot of things I preach that are not popular in a lot of circles. A lot of people look at me and say, oh, preacher, you're too old-fashioned. You get worked up over things that God doesn't care about. You know, you talk about preachers preaching in jeans and in, 
you know, uh, uh, t-shirts and looking all sloppy. And God doesn't care about that. Yes, he does. And you can think I'm old-fashioned. You can think I'm outdated all you want to. The truth of the matter is, Daddy has allowed his son to believe that you can approach God in a haphazard way. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Eli's sons, the priest's sons, the pastors who have come before me have taught those preachers who were under them that they could just approach God any old haphazard way. That God's cool. God's funky. God doesn't, you don't need to show respect to the Lord. You don't need to honor God by reason of your attire when you're in the pulpit, when you're in what is often referred to as the sacred desk. You'll notice I got us a new one. A little, little nicer than that little old metal thing we were in. That little metal thing sits so low. And the preacher's too old, I can't read stuff 20 feet away. Amen. <clears throat> there are many things that have come into the church. I'm going to tell you, uh, you know, I love to tease. And I do tease about people coming from various other church backgrounds. I'm just teasing. I've told you before, my grandmother started her journey toward the Lord. She grew up Roman Catholic. She first came to the Lord in a knowledge of the gospel at any level in a Baptist church. She then went into a, a Trinitarian Pentecostal, the Assemblies of God, and ultimately found her way into an independent, Jesus' name, apostolic church. People travel through a variety of avenues to get where they need to go. So where you've been doesn't matter. What matters is where you're going and where you're at now. Amen? But I'm going to tell you today, there in the apostolic movement, I'm not going to pick on the Baptist or the Methodist or the Episcopalian or the Lutheran. I'm going to pick on us apostolic folks. In the apostolic movement, there are a lot of things that daddy has permitted. What do I mean by daddy? I mean the older generation of priests. And they've allowed the younger generation of priests or pastors to come in and convince the church that it's okay for our music to sound worldly. It's okay for us to worship with these anointingless, meaningless, dribble songs. Until now, Johnny... Uh, if, if you knew the apostolic and the Pentecostal movement as I've known it for the last 53 years, you go into the average Pentecostal church today, it's as dead as a door knocker. There is no move of God like there used to be. There is no power of God like there used to be. The worship is not filled with joyous praise and shouting and dancing in the aisles like it used to be. No, you can go in now and you don't know whether you're in First Baptist or First Pentecostal. You don't know whether you're in First Methodist or First Pentecostal because the worship's just the same. Everybody sits there on their hands and everybody sings their little songs and there's no heart, there's no joy, there's no uh, spirit, spirited worship like there used to be. Why? Because the younger generations have been allowed to degrade things and the elder generation has said nothing. Eli's allowed his sons to get out of hand. And I'm here to tell you today, that's exactly what we're seeing in the church today. The enemy knows I cannot destroy the church from without. For Jesus Christ said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So the enemy knows that, listen to me now, it is impossible for him to defeat the church. He can't do it. Satan cannot kill the church if he wanted to. Christianity, I got news for you. Uh, those of you out there who are atheists who would love to see Christianity die, it will not happen. It'll never happen because Jesus has said that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. There is nothing in this world powerful enough to destroy the church of the Almighty God. So the enemy knows I can't get it from without, but what I can do is pollute it from within. Amen. 
If I can get into the pulpits, I can water things down. If I can get into the pulpit, I can cause things to become diluted. If I can get into the worship leading, I can cause the worship to become meaningless. If I can get into the music, I can cause the music to become worldly and useless. If I can just get inside, I can do more damage from the inside. I can't destroy the church, but I can certainly hinder it in accomplishing its mission. The Word of God tells us in 1 Samuel 3 that at the time that Eli was growing older and Samuel was growing up under Eli's tutelage, the Word of God was in short supply. It said there was no general revelation, meaning that God was so shut out that he wasn't hardly able to speak to the people of God because there were very few avenues whereby he could speak to the people of God. I want to tell you a little secret today, folks. There are very few avenues that God can talk to the church today. There are very few preachers who aren't just trying to preach what they need to preach to fill their offering plates. There are very few preachers who aren't just trying to preach what is going to fill their pews. There are very few preachers who aren't trying to preach what is going to make them a celebrity and a star. They're not ministering to the Lord like little Samuel did. No, 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 no. Their focus isn't God at all. They're focused on all kinds of things. We got preachers in the church today who are focused on building kingdoms unto themselves. <clears throat> I remember pastoring my first church 35 years ago. A little over. And I told our people then... I said, I'm going to tell you, I have a problem with preachers who name everything related to their ministry after themselves. I have a problem with that. I, I said, there's something about that that doesn't hit me right. And uh, so you look at Oral Roberts Ministries, which is followed by Oral Roberts University. Gee, are we building the kingdom of God or are we building the kingdom of Earl Roberts? Amen. Jimmy Swaggart Ministries. Jimmy Swaggart Bible College. Are we building the kingdom of God or are we building the kingdom of Jimmy Swaggart? Do you hear what I'm telling you yes, today? I do. Most preachers today, if you look at their ministry, if you look at their work, their name is prominent. If you look at our website, you will see, and I do this on purpose, and I've done it this way for decades. You will see any time you see the pastor's name appear on our website, any time you see the pastor's name appear on any header or anything on any of our Facebook pages or anything like that, it is in the smallest print. You know why I do that? Because he must increase. I must decrease. It's not about me. It's not about me. I'm not trying to elevate me. If you need to know who the pastor is, okay, I provide the information. But it's right there in little print. You're not, it's not going to be big, huge, dominant print. No. I don't call. When, I, when God called me into a firm in ministry back in 1993, I said, Lord, what will I call this ministry? Because I won't call it Charles Morrow Ministries. It'll never happen. I said, Lord, what shall I call this ministry? And the name that I adopted was Grace Oasis Ministries. That way, anything my ministry did, anything we did, whether it was a publish a website or anything, it always said, copyright, Grace Oasis Ministries. She didn't see my name. I didn't do that, Bill, because I was... Uh, Trying to hide something or I was afraid. No, I did that because I don't, I believe in ministry being humble. I believe in ministry uh, not, you know, elevating their name and not trying to create a reputation for themselves. You see, yeah, you see uh, websites that we put, put out and it says, you know, copyright, uh, Grace Laces Ministries. You don't know who the person is. All you know is the ministry. Now, am I the person who oversees that ministry? Yeah. But you know what? 
You don't see my name everywhere, do you? No. This is why I do this. But I'm here to tell you today, we live in a time when the Word of God, listen to me now carefully, is in short supply. Yes. Just like the era of Eli the priest, the Word of God was precious in those days, and there was no open vision. I'm here to tell you today, folks, the Word of God is precious in these days, and there is no open vision. One of the things that troubles me about people who leave churches so quickly and who are careless about exiting churches is they oftentimes are doing this to their own peril. And I'm not talking to, to people related to this church and this church alone. Let me tell you something. I know for a fact because I talk to pastors and other preachers all the time. There are people out there in the affirming movement who are doing a good work. And they're struggling to try to do a good work. And yet there are people who will just leave the church over every little thing. And they don't understand. Listen, if you find somebody who's being faithful to the Word of God, if you find somebody who's delivering the Word of God, you better cherish that. Because the Word of God is precious and there is no open vision. You can't just turn on any preacher on TV and hear the Word of God. You can't just turn on any preacher on the radio and hear the Word of God. Now, can you hear a message from the Bible? Oh, yeah. I got news for you. I remember years ago, I was dating a girl. This is way back. <laughs> My first real girlfriend, Barbara. And uh, her brother at the time was part of the KKK. And I'll never forget when I found this out. You know, I was repulsed. I, I was just so disgusted at the idea that he was part of the KKK. And he gave me some literature about the KKK. And do you know in that literature it had the gall to tell me that the KKK was a Christian organization? Do you know they had the gall to quote the Bible in their literature? So I'm going to tell you something, folks. Just because somebody preaches from the Bible does not mean they're delivering the Word of God. Amen. You can twist scripture, you can mistranslate, you can misappropriate, you can misrepresent scripture, you can contort it until it says all kinds of things. You can make it say things that it never in this world was meant to say. Every day. So to think that just because somebody is preaching from the Bible that they're preaching the Word of God, you are sadly mistaken. I'm here to tell you today, the Word of God in this day and in this hour as we approach the last days is in short supply. Listen to what the prophet Amos said in Amos chapter 8 verses 11 through 13. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. In that day shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst. The Lord said, the day is coming when the word of God will be in very short supply. And even the strongest, who are the strongest? The youngest, the young, the, the virgin it says, you know, those who are young and strong, even they are going to faint because there will be no bread which is the Word of God. There will be no water, which is the Spirit of God. I'm here to tell you, we live in a time like this. How can I say that again? I read to you, second, excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Paul writes to his young apprentice, Timothy, I charge thee therefore before God, 
and the Lord Jesus Christ, or even the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Don't preach your opinion. Preach the word. Don't preach church dogma. Preach the word. Don't preach tradition. Preach the word. What the people of God need today is the word. The word of the Lord was precious in those days. And there was no open vision. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come. Now this is Paul talking about our time. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers. Having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. And shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and look at this last line, make full proof of thy ministry. What was Paul saying to his Samuel? What was Eli saying to Samuel? But in this case, it's Paul to Timothy. What was Paul saying? He said, wait on the Lord. Minister to the Lord. Focus on your ministry. He said, make full proof of thy ministry. Focus on the work that God has called you to do. There's a reason why for the past 25 years I've been doing what I've been doing. Not because it's easy. Not because it's given me some great payday. Not because I get, you know, a marvelous salary. Not because I've become a celebrity. But because this is what God called me to do. And I have been focused on doing what God's called me to do. And all I know how to do, God help me, all I know how to do is focus on what God's called me to do. All I can do is focus on making full proof of my ministry. I don't care what what other churches are doing. I don't care what other preachers are preaching. I don't even care what other affirming churches are doing. No, Samuel can't afford to focus on what Eli's sons are doing. Am I telling the truth now? Now, Samuel better stay focused on the work of God. He better stay focused on the ministry. I could easily look at other affirming churches in the Pentecostal apostolic movement and say, well, you know, those preachers get up and they just preach rousing messages that are designed to get the people carrying on and shouting and, and making all kind of noise. Uh, could I do that? Yeah, I could. I could. The only problem is uh, if I did, I wouldn't be preaching the messages God gave me to preach. Mm -hmm. I can't preach what they preach because that ain't what God's given me to preach. And if I'm going to focus on doing what I'm called to do and ministering to the Lord, then I've got to do what God's called me to do. And whether it lines up with what they're doing or not doesn't matter. People may look at our videos and say, how come in your videos people aren't dancing and shouting and carrying on? Well, I'll tell you why. Because a lot of the affirming Pentecostal churches where people are doing that, they're immediately leaving the church to go hustling. They're going out to cruise. They're going out to drink. They're going out to drug. They come into church to satisfy their religious fix. And then they leave to live like the world and act like the devil. That's not how Christians are supposed to live or walk and do. No, this little church, God bless our heart, we may not have as many people. We may not have the musicians. I'd love to have them. I'm not going to lie to you. I'd love to have the musicians. I'd love to have the worship leaders. I'd love to have a choir. I'd love to have all kinds of things. But I'm focused on the here and now. I'm not trying to be like Eli's sons. I'm not trying to be like other churches. 
We're not trying to be like other churches. Johnny, if you wanted to be like other churches, you'd go to another church. Amen. We're together. It's not just me. It's us. Amen. We're not trying to be. There are people who tune into us online every Sunday and every Wednesday. And the reason they tune in is because we're not like other churches. Hallelujah. They know the word of God is precious. And they know that it is not today an open vision. They know that the word of God is in short supply. And if you find a source where the word of God is being preached, then honey, you better plug into that source. My God, the word of God declares, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? The word of God. Jesus said, when the Son of Man returns, nevertheless, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith in the earth? What does that tell you? That tells you the word of God will be in short supply. That tells you that a lot of preachers are going to be preaching from the Bible, but they're not going to be preaching the word of God. Because if the word of God is not being preached, then faith begins to wane. Because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. My desire and my hope is everybody who tunes into our uh, program, and pro tunes in, I hate to say the word program, into our services, uh, that when they're done listening to this service, their faith is renewed and restored and strengthened and they feel the encouragement to keep walking with God and to keep walking hand in hand with Jesus. Hallelujah. That's my desire. That's my goal. That's my hope. That's my concern. That's my calling. That's all I can focus on. I'm not concerned. I'm not, I can't sit here and worry about how many people we got today in church. I can't sit here and worry about whether or not we've got a building or whether we're having to meet in other circumstances. I, I can't focus on those things. Those are non-essential, non-important things. Amen. I've got to do the work that God has called me to do. We today have been called to speak the Word of God in an age when the Word of God is in short supply. Now, we may not be the obvious heirs, <laughs> but that does not mean that we are not God's called and chosen. Amen. The key is not simply to try and be as our predecessors or even our siblings, but rather to put the Lord first and to minister to Him in all our ways, seeking first and foremost to please Him. Samuel grew up with Eli as his spiritual example, as his mentor, and as his teacher. He did not seek to be like Eli's sons, with whom he surely shared much in common, but rather he sought to be like Eli. Hallelujah. Many today, even in the affirming church movement, strive simply to be like other churches. A lot of affirming churches, uh, Tommy, they spend all their energy and all their time trying to look like other churches. Because after all, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create a church for, that's open and affirming of LGBT people. But we want it to look as much like the other guys as, as we can get it to look. We want our building to look like their buildings. We want our environment to look like their. We want our choir to look like their choir. We want our robes to look like them. I tell them the truth today. We want to look as much like our siblings as we can. They, don't, they do everything in their power to look and to act like other churches of this era. The problem is that the other churches have fallen just like Eli's sons and are behaving in ways that grieve the Lord and displease Him greatly. We need today to focus on being what we are called to be and not being like everyone else. Being accepted and conforming to the norms of the day may be an easier way to go, but it's not the right way to go. I will tell you today, 
Now, you all know I loved my pastor that I had years ago, Brother Gillum. I talk about him all the time. He was a great mentor to me. I learned a lot from Brother Gillum. There was so much that I appreciated from him. But, you know, there were things Brother Gillum did that even back then I didn't quite understand. Brother Gillum believed in holiness. He believed in the standards, you know, that, that, that you would dress a certain way and you carried yourself. Now, again, I say, uh, if you're doing that as unto the Lord, I have no gripe with you. I have no issue with you. And Brother Gillum and Sister Gillum, uh, I can honestly say, I don't believe there was a legalistic bone in their body. They, they were not highly educated people. They were rather simple people. But everything they did, they did from a place of absolute love for God and sincerity. But you know what I found interesting? I found it interesting. Here I was, a young preacher. I'd come into the holiness movement, you know, Johnny. I was believing all these things, you know. And yet Brother Gillum would have preachers come into his church to preach. And they didn't live like Brother Gillum did and Sister Gillum did. They didn't embrace those same standards. Now, I did. I embraced those standards. I believed the way he believed. But he'd bring in, well, you know why? Because one of those preachers was a family member. One of those preachers had grown up in his church and had been a member of his church. The one preacher, that used, a young man that used to come in, uh, his wife, you know, cut her hair and wore jewelry and makeup and the whole nine yards. And this is all stuff where they go and doesn't believe in. But he'd let these preachers come in and preach for him. Why? Be well, because they're, they're young people from my church. They're young people who grew up in this church. I kind of have to cut them a little slack. Eli let his sons get away with things. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Eli let his guard down. Eli was allowing the younger generation. Let me tell you what happened. One of those young preachers has since become the general overseer, the top dog of the denomination that I belonged to at that time. Does he live like Brother Gillum lived? Not by a long shot. Does he preach like Brother Gillum preached? Not by a long shot. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? How far did Brother, did Brother Gillum's influence go in allowing things and not standing up for things and saying, you know, I love you and you grew up in our church, but if you don't embrace what, we, what you were taught and what you know to be our standard and what we believe, because I'm going to tell you, you, you start letting people come in, all you're doing is sending the message it's okay. You don't have to believe the way we believe. You don't have to believe what I preach. You don't have to believe. Do you follow what I'm saying? And, and, and I believe Brother Gillum did it. I'm not picking on the man. I believe he did it out of sincere love for these people. And, you know, I believe he was very sincere. But I'm trying to illustrate and make a point today, folks. I'm trying to close. When I get up and preach in this pulpit, I do not assume for one second that my audience is full of LGBT people. Not for one minute. Now, do I believe there are a lot of LGBT people? Sure. I, I, that's because that's who we reach out to. and We're trying to help LGBT people restore their faith and reconcile their faith. But do I get up and preach in this pulpit as though the only audience I have is an LGBT? No. You know why? Because I'm not the redheaded stepchild of the church. I don't see us, Johnny, as being some fringe movement within the church. Just because Eli had sons didn't mean Eli's sons were going to do the job right. right. No, God called little Samuel in and said, I've got a work for you to do. I got news for you today. I feel like Samuel. I feel like there's a lot of preachers out there in the church today who may do things a different way and they may have, uh, their daddy, so to speak, in the faith, may have allowed them to get away with a whole lot of stuff. But when I have correction, when I have reproof in that, what Paul said to Timothy, preach, said, what did he say? He said, rebuke, rebuke, rebuke reprove, exhort 
with all long suffering and doctrine. Uh, Bill, when the church needs a good kick in the butt, I'm going to give it to them. You know why? Because that's what God called me to do. See, I'm not up here worried about whether the listener is LGBT or whether the listener is straight or, or is married or divorced. No, I'm here to preach to the entire church of the living God. I'm here to preach to all people. Anybody that will listen needs to receive what I'm saying. And if they ignore what I'm saying because of what they perceive me to be, it is to their own detriment. Because right. i got news for you. God spoke through a donkey once. <laughs> And if God could speak through a donkey once, he can talk through this jackass. Amen. <laughs> Amen. 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 Our job is to stay true to the Word of God. We today, folks, have been called. And when I say we, I, I do not mean this church alone. I, I don't even mean just we affirming churches. But churches today, pastors today... Christians today who love the Word of God, who love the truth of God, who are able to endure sound doctrine. We have been called to be the voice of the Lord in an hour when the voice of the Lord is in short supply. Right. Oh, we may get a lot of ridicule. We may get a lot of jiving. We may get a lot of uh, grief thrown our way. I know I do. But I also know today... That my job, like little Samuel's, and our job, like little Samuel, is to minister to the Lord, not to minister to Eli. Sorry. Amen. We're not ministering. You know, that's the problem. When you hear the word minister, you think that that means, well, they minister to the people of God. Well, they do. They minister to the people of God on behalf of the Lord. But the first responsibility of a minister of the gospel is to minister to the Lord. What does that mean? That means I'm supposed to keep a constant line of communication open with the Lord. I'm supposed to keep the presence of the Lord available. When you come into my home, when you come to me to talk to me, you should immediately have access to the presence of God. Not because of who I am, but because I'm doing my job right. I'm ministering to the Lord. I'm keeping the presence of the Lord handy. Ask Tommy what I do on my way to Oklahoma in the car. I sing, I say, drive him nuts, I'm sure. I sing, I sing, I sing. You know why? Because when you minister to the Lord, hallelujah, you invite his presence. You bring his presence down. The word of God said God inhabits the praises of his people. I'm constantly in a state of prayer. I'm constantly in a state of worship. Constantly. Why do I do that? Because my job is to minister to the Lord. Because if I don't first minister to the Lord, I cannot possibly minister to you. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, bless the Lord. I tell you today, you better take that call. God's called us. He's called us to a work just like he called Samuel to a work. And you better take that call. Don't ignore it. Don't think that your marching orders are supposed to come from Eli because no, no, Eli's the representative of God. But the one you're supposed to get your orders from is God. Amen. Too many people today, they think their marching orders come from the UPC. They think their marching orders come from Brother Tinney. They think their marching orders come from, uh, you know, Brother uh, Urshan, the head of the United Pentecostal Church. And, and I'm picking especially on apostolics today. No, your marching orders are supposed to come from God. If there's something Brother Tinney allows that ought not to have been allowed, if there's something going on that Eli has allowed that ought not to have been allowed, then you need to go with God's direction, not Brother Tinney's. If the general overseer, the general superintendent of United Pentecostal Church lets things go on in the church regarding the way they worship and the way they do things, and you know better, then you better go with the way you know. Because your job is to minister to the Lord, not to minister to the general superintendent of the United Pentecostal Church. You'd better take that call. We need the Word of God. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Hallelujah.